Hi, my name is Noel Bell and today I'm chatting with Paula Hall, who's a sexual and relationship psychotherapist and author of a number of books including Understanding and Treating Sex Addiction. Paula, great that you're on the line. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. I have my coffee. I am ready. Can I just ask you first, why sexual addiction as an area of expertise for you in your practice? Um, I started my career in counselling 20 years ago working in a drug agency, working for a drug agency. Um, and then I trained with Relate, doing the, the relationship stuff, and then trained as a psychosexual therapist. And uh, it was about 10 years, well, a bit more than 10 years ago, 2011, there was a conference on sex addiction, a, a sex therapy conference. Um, and it just made sense to me, basically. And I sat there, as many therapists do when they go to these things, thinking, oh, my goodness, I had a client like that. Oh, yes, that makes sense. And suddenly these clients that I remembered who'd been coming to me with compulsive sexual behaviours, although I wouldn't have talked about it that, like that at the time, um, just just kind of made sense. Um, and it, it just it just really, really kind of linked in with the old addiction work that I'd done. And, yeah, it just made sense to me, basically. How would you describe sex addiction? It is it's any kind of sexual behaviour that feels out of control and has harmful consequences. So if it's harmful consequences, it's not a problem. So it's, it's, you know, it's only a problem if it's a problem. A bit like you mentioned later on about compulsive gambling, a bit like if you were a multi-millionaire and you were gambling and losing you know, £10,000 a week. Um, perhaps if you're a multi-millionaire, that's not a problem. You can do that. Because but if it is a problem, if it is causing you significant harmful consequences, but in spite of that you still can't stop, then it's an addiction. Because often with sexual uh, issues, there are some who see sexual behaviour as a lifestyle issue rather than compulsivity. Indeed, indeed. And if it's not causing somebody a problem, it's, it's not a problem. Um, I mean, we know that there are some biological things that, that happen, and I'm sure we'll come on to that, um, which potentially put it in the same kind of arena as other chemical addictions. Um, but, yeah, if it's not causing you a problem, and we know there are functioning alcoholics, and there are functioning drug users, and they are at that place because at the moment, that moment in time, it's not causing them any significant damage. It is a lifestyle choice. They are able to take their cocaine or drink as much as they drink and continue to function and often it's you know it, it's, it's not a problem until it becomes a problem um, I think one of the real complications with sex addiction compared to the other addictions and where people get confused is it really is not about the behavior it's not about pathologizing the behavior so it doesn't matter whether it's compulsive masturbation pornography use visiting sex workers um, multiple relationships um, it's your relationship to it it's your dependency on it that defines it as an addiction. So in the same way as, so when people say that you're just pathologizing diverse sexual behaviors, so when we're talking you know, about alcoholism, we're not pathologizing whiskey or pathologizing cider or gin. And the type of alcohol is irrelevant. It is the dependency on it yeah. that is a problem. And often with some addictions, I mean, there's the sex, drugs and rock and roll kind of glamour, quote, yeah. glamour issue attached to some addictions. And I've come across people who will invariably kind of laugh, some would snigger, talking about sex addiction. Like, that's an addiction oh, I'd like to have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's Oh, that's a nice problem to have. So... Um, do we have, as a society, and particularly as a profession, a long way to go to deal with some of these taboos around sex addiction? Absolutely, absolutely. I think the problem is too much emphasis is put on the word sex as opposed to addiction. Mm. And, and what that is where, and it, it, what I find interesting is when you start talking about sex offending, everybody hears the word offending. Yeah. And, and you know, and therapists are like, oh gosh, no, I wouldn't work with that. Not when it's sex offending, but somehow if it's sex addiction, well, I work with sexual issues, therefore it's okay. You know, the emphasis needs to be on the word addiction, not on the word sex. The, the, the drug of choice, if you like, is irrelevant in terms of treatment. 
and it causes just as many problems in people's lives as any other kind of addiction does. And I, I think, I mean, I, you know, I, I really feel for my clients when, you know, you do read in the media, that's a problem I'd like to have, or they just play as lucky sod or whatever, because actually, you know, when I've got a client in front of me who's lost his job, lost his wife, lost residency with his children, has lost his friends, lost his self-esteem, his sense of integrity, yeah. um, it's a little bit insulting to say the least. Oh, it's not really a problem. And what did you think of the recent um, film, uh, Shame, that dealt with this? I thought it was very, very good. Yeah. Very good. I thought it, it, it really did give a portrayal, uh, uh, an accurate dip, the portrayal, of, um, portrayal of the the kind of devastation that it causes, the emptiness um, of just how little fun it is. Yeah. I did a recent blog post. I, I, I was quite affected by a, film, a, a documentary on the Moors murderers, and actual documentary dealt with some of the mental health advocacy dealing with Ian Brady. And I was quite affected, just thinking, well, if how would I feel dealing with, say, you know, like a sexual offender like that? But chatting to a psychiatrist, he said, "Killers are people too." Yeah. Yeah. Now, I thought just what you said there about sexual offending, often we kind of de we're very quick to demonize, but yes, in your practice, how important is it to stay open minded and receptive to any client who walks in or, or other people that you choose not to work with? Um, absolutely essential. And I, 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 again, I think when when people in the therapeutic community are saying they're not sure if sex addiction exists or these are just guys with no morality, they've just lost their moral compass or whatever, I just think you, you need to sit in a room and meet them. You yeah. need to be with these people to really understand what's going on. And it, it very quickly becomes apparent when you see the, you know, the absolute desperation and devastation that it doesn't matter whether it's been someone who's been sat at their computer with porn or whether it's been somebody who's actually slipped into perhaps illegal territories with pornography um, someone who's going to you know fetish clubs all the time and, and getting involved in all sorts of behaviors that they actually find quite abhorrent themselves um, what you notice what you feel is is probably cliche but is their pain mm. and it quickly disappears or, you know, what it is they're into, if you like. At what point does someone diagnose themselves as having a problem? I, I think it's about balance. It's about it's when it's getting in the way of other areas of your life. I mean, I, I think um, young people are just as social as they ever were. They just do it in different ways. And I, you know, I'm a great fan of the internet and social networking, and it means that my daughters who've been home from university uh, are still in touch with all their friends who've gone back to various points around the country and they're still in touch they know what they've been doing over the summer or this that and the other so it's you know it's great it's an absolutely wonderful tool um i think in terms of sexual information on the internet young people have the opportunity to explore their sexuality it's, i mean it's the safest sex you can have mm. in a really safe kind of way they can get access to sexual information that they would have had to have asked their parents about or relied on magazines or whatever um so I, I think it's great but it's it's when you have a problem when you know that other people are going out when you would prefer to be sat on your computer than go out for the evening so someone is saying hey there's a party yeah. on saturday night or there's a real girl that's interested in you and is stroking your thigh at a party and you think mm, very nice i'll go home and log on it's when you're actually prioritising those activities over any kind of face-to-face -face interaction. And in my experience, and I have an awful lot of young clients, young, predominantly men, which I'm sure we'll get on to, um, who are aware, so I've got, you know, I've had a, a run, it seems, of 25-year-old virgins. Right. Their online activities are... Um, really quite amazing when they've kind of done online and seen online yeah. but they've never actually got into a relationship with a girl and of course what happens is increased social anxiety yeah. and nervousness about you know getting involved in those real offline relationships and that's when they really recognize that actually this is getting in the way of my life yeah 
So it's, it's about balance. Uh, it is about, I also wouldn't want to give the message that there is anything wrong with using sex as a way of escaping, uh, you know, of, of unwinding. Uh, another key sort of definition of all addictions, not just sex addiction, is that it becomes a way of managing difficult emotions. Now, there's nothing wrong, you know, potentially with going online, masturbating, having sex with a partner, whatever it is, when you've had a bad day. In the same way as I'm sure there are many people who have occasionally drunk too much alcohol, yeah. who may have used alcohol um, because they want to get in the mood for going out or because they want to, you know, numb out a difficult day. It's when you're doing it all the time, it's when it becomes your only coping strategy that it's a problem. Yes, but that leads on to a question that's probably off script. Are there people more susceptible to addiction than others, in your opinion? Yes, yes, um, undoubtedly. Um, we know that people with a history of addiction in the family are more likely to get addicted. Uh, part, partly that may be learnt behaviour, but that may also be to do with brain development and do particularly dopamine regulation. So if you have a history of addiction, you're more likely to develop an addiction you know, across the board, any kind of addiction. Um, also, people um, who've experienced traumas, so any kind of trauma can also predispose you towards addiction. Um, and also people um, with, I'm trying to think who your audience is now, but with attachment issues. Mm -hmm. People who've had you know, difficult um, relationships with parents, perhaps they've been absent parents, perhaps they've been neglectful, perhaps they've been abusive. And what happens in those situations is that you may grow up as somebody who feels um, more, you will have more trust and more faith in turning to something in times of need rather than someone. For anyone listening who might think they have a problem, how would you advise them to go about seeking treatment for sex addiction? Um, unfortunately, there are still very limited resources within the UK. That is something that is, is um, slowly changing. So slowly it is kind of taking off now. Uh, there's an organisation called ATSAC, um, that's the Association for the Treatment of Sex Addiction and Compulsivity. And there are a list of therapists on there and different kind of organisations that can provide help. And there are, of course, 12 step groups as well. Um, I think the you know the first thing is um, about you know really looking at your behaviour yourself and looking at why it feels out of control. Have you tried to stop? What happens when you try to stop? Um, there are a number of kind of online resources as well. Certainly, there's an assessment tool on the ATSAC website, there's mm -hmm. an assessment tool on my website, um, which can also allow people to um, to look at whether or not they think they have an addiction. So would. Dr. Carnes be the expert in this field? Um, he, he's one of many. He's certainly the best known in, in America. Um, certainly Out of Shadows, Out of the Shadows is one of you know, the first books on sex addiction and it's, it's still very good. Um, I would say if you can wait until November you can get my book, uh, which is Understanding and Treating Sex Addiction and that's actually the first UK book. One of the problems that we've had is that so much um, of the information has come from the States. Um, also, one of the issues that's kind of got in the way of really understanding sex addiction in the UK has been that an awful lot of the treatment providers have come from a, um, a religious perspective. Yeah. And that, for some people, really gets in the way. I, I think if you're reading Out of the Shadows or some of the other books, they some of them do have a very clearly defined idea of what healthy sexuality is mm -hmm. and there does seem to be a bit, bit kind of moral stuff that kind of comes in and I think that doesn't necessarily fit with some of our culture which is why I, I certainly felt it's very important to get a, a UK book out there. Why has the psychiatric profession been slow to recognise this condition as an illness? I think I think there are I mean, a number of reasons. I mean firstly it's a very sort of practical issue the fact that it doesn't exist in DSM so, yeah. you know, the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, it is not in there, and it's unlikely to get in the revised version 5 that comes out very soon. Um, the reason for that is, I think, is really quite complex. It is, at the moment, the way that addiction is defined, or one of the criteria for how addiction is defined, is that there needs to be um, clinical evidence of escalation, and there needs to be clinical evidence of withdrawal. Um, at the moment, that evidence doesn't exist. Certainly, anecdotally, it does, and there are most people who work in sex addiction would definitely say there's an escalation, and I think that's something else that people can be aware of. If you find you're needing more pornography than you used to, mm -hmm. if you find you're looking at harder core 
pornography than you used to. Um, if you find that um, you know, you're visiting more sex workers, that your behaviour is just getting more and more extreme and it takes you more and more to get the same kind of impact, that is escalation and that is also a very sure sign of addiction. Mm -hmm. But at the moment there hasn't been sufficient clinical research for that to be accepted within DSM. Having said that, the American Society of Addictive Medicine are actually pushing forward to DSM that the, the whole definition of addiction needs to be revised. And um, you know, the old definitions in DSM don't work. And what they are suggesting is that it needs to go down and be recognized much more as a brain disorder. There needs to be, now that we know so much more about neuroscience, um, addiction needs to be recognized in terms of the impact that it has on the brain rather than the behaviors, which at the moment is how it's classified and defined. It should be based on what happens within the brain. If that revision actually goes forward, then sex addiction, compulsive gambling will automatically get into DSM. And does that follow for IC, is it ICD-10 yeah. as well? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think one tends to follow the other. I think we, we have to be aware that DSM um, is, is not just a medical tool, it's also actually a, a political tool as well. Um, yeah. if, you, if you imagine that actually pornography addiction went in and became classified as a problem, um, as soon as that happens, then people will be screaming to their GPs that they want help yeah. on the NHS. People will start screaming for preventative education and preventative measures. Um, the online porn industry is still the biggest revenue creator that we have across the world. Um, and that it would have massive, massive socio-political implications if it got into DSM. So I think there are also good political reasons for keeping it out. And presumably the porn industry, which is probably bigger than the armament industry, has a has an important lobbying function? Um, they they do certainly. You know, the big ISPs, a lot of the big companies, are very careful about um, making any judgments against the porn industry because they rely on them. All the technological advances that we currently have, particularly in terms of you know, computers, come up from the porn industry. It's the porn industry who first came up with subtitling, yeah, so that people with hearing impairments could enjoy porn more. That's slightly amusing, but what is there is actually being said, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and they're also responsible for online banking. It was the uh, the viewers of pornography who were saying, I don't want to be giving out, you know, sending checks in the post and whatever else used to happen. Can you please do you know, online banking? A lot of the uh, broadband came about from the porn industry. We have the porn industry to thank for broadband because people were getting sick and tired of the dial-up pixelated images taking 20 minutes to download. Yeah, absolutely. Computer. And also cams on the webcams were yep. developed, maybe not invented, but certainly developed by the porn industry. Yeah, I mean, they're the one, and also I remember um, reading somewhere that actually, you know, in terms of like the development of the smartphone, you know, one of the key considerations was if you can get porn on it, this is going to make sales rocket. Okay, absolutely. The ability to be able to get yeah, to, to, to put porn on something and to, to you know, increase those, um, the medium for that would make it, and it has, and it has created massive problems as well. So some of the guys that I work with who have, you know, successfully put child protection software, blocking software on their computers, on their routers, on their whatever, iPhone is just really that now. And that leads us on to another current issue about whether ISPs should block adult content as of the standard rather than getting parents to yeah, opt, opt in to opt the block. In rather than opt out. Do you have uh, any views on that? That seems to be happening and that, that's actually kind of going, going through government at the moment, isn't it? I think the consultation paper is finalised and yeah. has, has gone forward. Um, I think that is probably going to happen. I mean, you know, the, all the reasons put forward for it is about protecting children, which of, of course I think is absolutely right. But undoubtedly, it is also going to help the uh, you know people who are struggling with sex and porn addiction. And it's not just porn, of course. You know, some of the guys I work with, where it might have been visiting sex workers or multiple relationships, 
now with the internet, you know, you, if you've got a business meeting in half an hour's time in London, and you or you find out suddenly it's going to finish half an hour early, you can go online and find out where there's a massage parlour and have those numbers instantly. Yeah. And um, some of the people that are having multiple relationships, it might take some time to meet somebody to, you know, to have a one nighter with. Now with social networking, with sites like obviously illicit encounters and, and things like that, you can find somebody, you know, within within ten minutes. Mm. So in turn, and I think this this is why it's exploding so much at the moment because of opportunity, because we can. Mm. And I think that has also changed. And you were asking earlier about are there some people who are more predisposed than others? People are also more much more predisposed if if they have the opportunity. The guys that develop um, an addiction to multiple relationships are often very good looking. They have a natural opportunity that some others just do not have. If your work um, is one that takes you abroad a lot, takes you away a lot, if you have money, and nowadays if you just have a computer, it is so much easier to get addicted to, to sex and pornography than it ever was at any other time in history. So I, I think there is no doubt that this problem has probably gone back for centuries. It is just so easy now. How, how, just for purposes of clarification, what are you defining as porn? Can it be uh, sexual fantasies? Or is it always access to visual and audio material? Um, no, it's really the access to the visual material. We are, you know, we are all, as, as a species, as, as humankind, we are designed to be visually stimulated, and that's, you know, men and women. We're also pre-programmed to seek out variety, and, you know, going back to the Savannah days, hunter-gatherer, mm. um, we were pre-programmed to actually seek out different partners. That, that's, that's a natural thing to do. Um, it just so happens in those days, your choice were, you know, of four or five people and you're related to three of them um but now with the internet that that sort of primal urge that very sort of primary needs that we have that, that's very very natural um it can just absolutely explode it's, it's a bit like um you know we're pre-programmed to want sugar to want sort of you know fat in our diet and again in hunter-gatherer days when there was so little access to to fat and sugar we would have got it when we could and we would have binged on it because we weren't sure when we would next find some nice sweet honey that we needed for energy now that we have you know drive through fast food places we have you know sweets available in every store we we're getting you know global obesity problems and the same sort of thing is happening with pornography, the visual stimulation and the, the desire for variety that is a very natural innate drive now has the opportunity to go you know, completely crazy. Absolutely. Now, the, just since we're on this little sort of theme of diagnosis, if a, an alcoholic stops, I mean, most would agree an abstinence treatment model is yeah. the, the most appropriate for a sex addict it's not about abstinence it's not about abstinence so um, so what is healthy sex and that, fantasy I mean, that, that has got to be defined by each individual what is healthy and what is not healthy um and the i mean the exercise that i give my clients to which is one that actually comes from the 12-step community is that you define you sort of write a list of your sexual behaviors and then you break them into three categories those that are okay those that are definitely not okay and then there's kind of a gray area in the middle which are your iffy behaviors and they might either be not okay because um you kind of haven't made a decision yet they might be fundamentally okay, it's just that your wife hates it, so therefore it's not okay. Mm. Um, or it might be not okay because it leads on to the other stuff. Mm. So, for example, somebody whose problem is particularly with uh, maybe visiting sex workers, online pornography may never have been an issue for them. However, they know that if they do start looking at online pornography, within two clicks they're going to start looking at the escort sites. So it's the slippery slope for them, so they will then decide that actually that needs to be not okay. Yeah. But everybody needs to define what is um, healthy, positive, fulfilling sexuality for them that fits within their value system. And this is the other really important thing, particularly about our sexuality. 
Um, so, you know, it's not about prescribing monogamy because if that's not part of your value system, if you're, you know, very happy and comfortable within an open relationship, then that's, you know, that's going to stay in your okay box. Mm. It's got to fit within your value system. But where does and denial come in? Where Where is the addict in denial where they're justifying behaviours that they consider okay? Yeah, I've seen some huge okay lists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like, okay. Um, I mean, really that, you know, again, as a therapy kind of comes in, it's being able to challenge and say, I notice you've put this here, but I remember you telling me yeah. that actually last time you did this X, Y, and Z, or I'm not sure how you're going to contain that. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, lots of people will, or they minimise it. And the, there are so many cognitive distortions that keep addiction going. And we all have our cognitive distortions that allow us to do things that are against our value system, whether that's just parking on the double yellow line for five minutes mm. or, I don't know, not putting something down on your tax return form. We all have cognitive distortions and we, we use them, unfortunately. But in addiction, of course, they can, you know, begin to take over. I'm chatting with Paula Hall, who's a sexual and relationship psychotherapist, and we're discussing issues to do with sex addiction. How similar is the process addictions, such as gambling and sex addiction? Um, uh, so very similar. Uh, I mean, then the other one is eating disorders. Eating disorders is very, very similar to sex addiction. Mm -hmm. It becomes about, and again, it's like it's a natural appetite that becomes over controlled or out of control. It is very similar to the eating sort of disorders as well. What we're learning more and more about process addictions is the impact on the brain. That you know, the common denominator in all addictions, whether it's a chemical addiction or a process addiction, is dopamine. Mm -hmm. And the impact on dopamine of of gambling, of high risk behaviours, of sexual activities, of foods, um, are of the same as they it is with you know most of the chemical addictions as well. Yes, and and clearly, we're, there's a lot lot of high profile media cases of celebrities who come under this sort of area of process addictions. Let's talk about treatment models for sex addiction. We've mentioned the twelve step community, um, so effectively, how do you treat sex addiction? It's uh, in its simplest form. It's, it's about two two strategies. One is understanding what the function of the addiction is. So addictions become a way of managing a life that feels out of control, is often what happens. It may not start like that, but that is how it becomes. So what is the function of it? Why is it that you're turning to, and what so many sex addicts will say is, it's not about the sex. So it's, you know, it's about it's other stuff that they get out of it. If you're sitting looking at porn for five, six, seven, eight hours at a time, it's not just about the release of orgasm. Mm. There's all the other stuff that's going on. So it's a, what is the actual function of it? What are you really getting out of this? And sometimes it becomes a way of getting affirmation, feeling good about yourself. Sometimes it's a way of escaping the you know, pressures of work, escaping feelings of low self-esteem, escaping a brilliant anger management tool. Loads and loads of guys use sex addiction as an anger management tool. It calms me down. Um, if you're a trauma survivor, then it may be a way of regulating hyperarousal and hypoarousal states. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a way of managing that. So really, what is the function of the addiction and how can you meet that function in a healthy way? The second bit are very practical, pragmatic relapse prevention strategies. Um, if at all possible, you, you, know, you learn to recognize what your triggers are. If at all possible, you avoid them. What can you do in your life? How can you change your life in a way that you avoid triggers as much as possible? Um, unfortunately, a lot of triggers are unavoidable. We do live in a you know, very sexualized society over here. Um, so, yeah, how what are you going to do if you do meet a trigger? What can you do in very, very pragmatic relapse prevention terms? The question of whether someone going into a 12-step recovery meeting uh, and all the potential shame and embarrassment of that versus seeing 
a one-to-one -one counselor in a an anonymous setting. You sort of well, there's a huge amount of um, people who are trained in treating sex addiction will recommend group work. So I work um, with clients individually, but I also highly recommend group work. So I, I provide my own group treatment program, the Hall Recovery Course, which is now available around the UK. So there's lots and lots of centres and places are now delivering the Hall Recovery Course. Um, Precisely because what group work does is um, a, a number of things. One is actually it breaks through shame in a way that individual therapy can't because you are sitting in a room of other people who have been through the same thing, who knows exactly what it's like. And what you quickly find is they're actually really, really nice guys. I mean, yeah. you've got a huge amount of respect for them. And you really like them and you have a laugh. And actually it bounces back. You realise that actually maybe I'm not a freak. An awful lot of sex addicts will describe themselves as a freak. Their behaviour is crazy, it's mad, it's counter to anything that they believe in, that they want to do, it's causing them problems, they keep doing it. Um, and actually, it just sort of proves that actually, I'm not the only one, I'm not alone. Normal people have this problem. So it actually, conversely, whilst it's one of the most embarrassing, most courageous steps you can take, it actually breaks through shame in a way that individual work can't do. There's also the very basic fact that as much as a therapist may tell you you're wonderful, you're a nice guy, you're a great husband, you're a good father, that'll be £50, please. Mm. <laughs> You've still got to pay, but it's not an equal relationship, but you do get that in the group environment. What it also does is provide uh, long-term support and long-term accountability. So most of the good guys from my groups continue to stay in touch um, or continue to meet separately, and that might be within their own group that they set up, or it might be at a 12 step program. So, the group environment is actually, uh, I don't know if it's essential for recovery, it kind of depends how bad an addict you are, if you like. So we tend to talk about addicts in such a binary term you either are or you aren't, but of course, there are mild cases and there are severe cases. Um, but yeah, an element of group work is, is, is essential for a lot of people. You're obviously a very experienced psychotherapist, so have you got the radar to spot if someone is coming to either group work or one-to-one -one work with a kind of vicarious pleasure, almost like getting off on talking about their triggers? Yes, it, it happens very, very rarely. But yes, I mean, I'm, you know, because I'm a, a sex therapist anyway, working with erotic transference and that kind of thing is actually part of it. Mm. Um, there's no doubt there are, there are some sex addicts who find it extremely difficult, um, if not impossible, to be in a relationship with any woman that they don't sexualize the mm. relationship. And so working with those transference issues as a woman is, is come on, this is both a burden, um, a curse and a blessing, because actually you can break through those things, but you do have to be able to work with them, which a male therapist doesn't have to do. Um, but again, in the, the, the group work context, you, you kind of get some balance to that. And will you get uh, erotic transference? Well, actually, do you, do you have female clients? No. In 10 years of working in sex addiction, I have had two inquiries from women, and neither of them turned up for the appointment. What, why is that? Well, the research, I did a, um, a bit of research in the UK, which will be in the book that comes out in November, um, and this actually backed up um, what, what the statistics in, in America exactly, that actually 25% of sex addicts are women now. But actually a much, 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 much smaller proportion come for help. So I think that we have a real, you know, generally... Um, when you look at kind of therapy statistics, it's the women that come for help, it's the women who can talk about it, it's the women who share their feelings and, you know, all that kind of stuff, and mm. the guys that don't. But actually in sex addiction, it, the opposite is true. I think there's still a lot of stigma for women mm -hmm. in sex addiction. I think there's um, a lot more shame, so, you know, societally enforced shame, you know, in the guys being players. We, we, we have a very, very different attitude to women who are sluts, as we will call them. Yeah. Um, it's, so I think, you know, seeking help is much, much harder for women, and it's something that we're just not talking about enough. Um, but I, I sincerely hope it's a situation that will begin to change. But I think also, you know, the media tends to always talk about male sex addictions, shame was that guy, you know, everything ends up being about men, um, which also then doesn't normalise it for 
to women. And some women would actually prefer to call themselves um, a love addict. So yes. I mean, the, the 12 step <laughs> program for sex and love addicts anonymous, you get a lot more women there. The behaviours are the same, frankly. It's multiple relationships, um, but they say, well, it's really about the chase, not the sex. And, well, actually, it's the same for guys as well. So it's, it's again, what it is you're addicted to isn't really the problem. The problem is that you suffer with addiction. And isn't it true that the 12 step fellowships in the sort of sex addiction are broken down? In theory, to be honest, there's, so, there's still not that many groups around in the UK, so people go to whichever one's nearest. Mm. Um, there's, there's actually three different fellowships within the UK. You've got SA, which is Sexaholics Anonymous, and Sexaholics Anonymous are, is a lot more um, spiritually based. Um, they have their bottom line, what they, they actually say, the bottom line for behaviour if you come to Sexaholics Anonymous includes, for example, no masturbation, no sex outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and it, it is outside of marriage, so that may not be the right place for um, you know gay, lesbian person to be going. So they're, they're very, very kind of strict on their model. And that's fine if that works for you, if that's where you want to go, then, then fine, but it's then doesn't suit everybody. And then you've got SAA, Sex Addicts Anonymous, and SLAA. There's very little difference. The only difference really is that in Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, you may get more women, and you may get more people who, uh, where it's multiple relationships that they're addicted to, rather than just being pornography. But often, I don't know, um, if you're in Plymouth, I'm just picking that out of the air, I'm not sure if it's true. Yeah. If you're in Plymouth and there's only an SLAA, then you'll go to that with porn addiction. And so the balance is often much more dependent on, you know, geography and the, the, the people around. Yeah. I, th I think, I mean, the other thing to remember with 12-step groups is that there, as with everything in life, there are good ones and there are not so good ones. Oh, absolutely. And there are yeah. ones that will suit you and ones that don't. There are good therapists, there are bad therapists. Yeah. And there are some very good therapists that you just don't like. <laughs> yeah. You just don't get on with. You don't like their model. It doesn't mean they're bad. They, you just didn't get on. And the same happens with twelve step. And I think one of you know the things that I find slightly frustrating is people who went to a twelve step meeting once didn't like the people, didn't like the format, and that's it. I don't like twelve step anymore. Um, or, or might not like the venue because it was a church or. Exactly. Exactly. But there, and, and there is an element of birth together. You know, birds of a feather flock together as well. So, you know, when groups start getting quite big, you'll get a lot of like-minded people there. I think mean, if you're fortunate enough to be in London, you can find another group. Yeah. Um, but in other areas of the country, unfortunately, that is your local group and that is it. And, you know, some people do have a real problem with the steps. And certainly I've had um, a couple of clients, because uh, cross addictions are very, very common, as you can imagine. So I've had a number of clients who've also um, are, are either alcoholics or recovering alcoholics or recovering drug users. Sure. Um, and they say that actually some of the steps just don't translate to sex addiction. Mm. It just doesn't. And obviously, the, the whole notion of sobriety being so different being you know one of the problems. And some of the stuff they've tried to sort of translate over from the big book just doesn't really work. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I think what Twelve Step offers is a community support, and it's free. <laughs> and Absolutely. That is something that at the moment there is just no competition out there for. So I will always recommend it to people. But you know, for others, for a lot of others, they need some therapeutic input as well. Of course, most Twelve Step groups um, are not. You know, they don't have a therapist there, and some of them can become. I suppose the ideal is to get a sponsor who's a therapist, is it? Oh, that'd be great, <laughs> yeah. That's because what, what I'm always trying to get across is that, you know, sex addiction is a health issue. It's not a moral issue, it's a health issue. Mm. Um, it's about people's lifestyle choices. People deserve the right to choose how they want to operate. It's, it's not a moral issue. But because so much of the treatment has come from the churches, it does become a moral issue. But those churches are offering services frequently for free. I mm. did my training you know, um, over in the States with Patrick Carnes, who's done some training over there. And there were 50 therapists in one of the modules that I went to, and 10 of them were ministers. Right. And they are offering huge treatment programs that are free to people who don't, it's very different in that, who don't have insurance. And the model for treatment is very, very different over there because of the whole insurance system. But there's services that no one, you know, people couldn't access in any other way. Mm. 
And so do you think there's an inbuilt bias then with I think there has been. So, and there's, I mean, again, this is why I wanted to write a UK book, because there are so few books that spirituality defined as God does not come up in, and some of them are absolutely overt. I've bought, particularly for partners, I've bought two or three partner books, and, um, you know, chapter four is praying together. Right. I am actually off record. I am a practicing Christian. I don't have any problem with that, but that's just not the way that some people are going to do them. Yeah. And of course, for some people, that book goes straight in the bin, even yeah. though there was some other good stuff in there. Yeah, sure. And it's it is really challenging. So, you know, I'm so grateful that they've actually, particularly in America, they have advanced the field of sex addiction in a way. Well, I don't know where we'd be without Pat Khan. Um, but it's also done a disservice to some. I'm chatting with Paula Hall, who's a sexual and relationship psychotherapist, and we're discussing issues to do with sex addiction. Let's deal with some of the training issues from the profession point of view. If someone was wanting to specialise in sex addiction treatment as an area of specialty, how would they go about it? Contact APSAC, look on the APSAC website. There is now a um, a professional certificate in sex addiction, which is available to therapists who are already trained, experienced, accredited, and want to do this as an additional speciality. Okay. It's um, eight two-day blocks. Yep. And what about someone going through training? Would it be an idea to maybe think about a potential placement that was in this area? know where to get a placement. Um, I mean, in London, there are you know two or three sort of bigger treatment places in London where you might be able to get a place at the Narrowbone Centre is one. Um, Focus Counselling, Robert Hudson, what's he called? It's IPC Counselling. Oh, I think that's right. Um, but they're sort of slightly bigger practices. I mean, I work as an individual therapist, but I, I have got therapists delivering my course in other locations as well. Yeah, I, th I think what you can do certainly is, and I, I mean, I've done this with a, a, I've got my next group starts tonight, my 16 week program starts tonight, and um, I've got a guy who's very interested in training, who's going to be my co-facilitator, who's co-facilitating the group. He certainly wouldn't be able to run a group um, or work with individuals, but certainly, I mean, co-facilitating groups is a fantastic way of getting to know about the area and the, the, the field. Absolutely. And the in your treatment model, so in your private practice, going through training, we're often thought about carrying a basic toolkit of approaches, of theory, of creative interventions. Yeah. And are you drawing from anything and everything, or do you have something dominating? Yeah, I, I, I kind of cop out a bit and just say it's an integrative approach. <laughs> yes, that always covers a multitude, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's integrative. Um, I think in terms of particular modalities, though, um, certainly the psychodynamic bit is really important in terms of looking at attachment. Yeah. I'm sure it's not the only way of looking at attachment, but for me, that's how I was trained, looking at attachment. Um, I think body work, body psychotherapy is increasingly important work with trauma. Um, I've had, for example, um, guys who've uh, come back from the forces from Afghanistan who've been traumatized who then discover online pornography as a brilliant way of self-soothing mm. five six years later they're addicted and this isn't childhood trauma this isn't attachment stuff this is adult trauma it was there there's no warning on the bottle yeah five six years later they're still addicted and actually doing some you know body trauma work is actually really important whether that's sensory motor or emdr personally i refer for that on the specialist in that as well but I, I refer but certainly an understanding of trauma work is essential because if you just take away the addiction and you don't deal with the trauma you're going to have bigger problems and so that I've seen that nearly happen with a client with a therapist who wasn't trained in sex addiction which is mm. telling him to stop and sometimes you need to not stop yet cut back a bit maybe but not stop until you've dealt with the trauma and found ways um, the CBT is also very important in terms of challenging uh, cognitive distortions, working in different relapse prevention strategies, changing thinking patterns, basic core, you know, fundamental core beliefs. Uh, and the other one that's really key um, is motivational interviewing. Understanding about motivational interviewing and the, the techniques of that 
are also really important ones. So if you've got someone coming in who's really just in the contemplative stage, I'm not really sure if I'm an addict yet, the motivational interviewing would all be about rolling with the resistance. Yeah, maybe you're not. Maybe you're not. Well, how, how might you know if you were? Yeah. So it's a way of, so you, get, you don't get trapped in the denial bit, basically, and competing with the denial. It's, it's a strategy for rolling with the resistance to kind of help them explore things. Um, and it was also really helpful um, when people are talking, you know, I, I can't do it, I can't do this, I can't do that, and getting very kind of down to when they've relapsed and actually using the so A very simple thing, how many times did you not act out this week? Right. What happened on those occasions would be a typical MI intervention. As opposed to, what happens, I mean, one client actually came in, this was a while ago, and said, sat down and said, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Yeah. <laughs> it just felt like every single session to me, going for confessional. You know, what What soon happens is, if that happens each session, they come in, they tell you, they go, oh, you unpick it, and they go, and they feel better, and they come back, and they sweat, and they relapse again. You just get caught in a cycle. So actually, like, how many times have you not relapsed? Yeah. What did you do? to really shift it. Absolutely. So, and finally, Paula, what has been the most satisfying part of your work as a psychotherapist? Oh, gosh. Um, I love it, it has to be said. I absolutely love this work. I love the group work. Watching the guys care for each other and support for each other and empathy with each other is incredibly powerful and moving. And just be, being, it's a privilege, doing group work particularly in that time, it's just such a privilege just, just, just being there and, and watching people grow. Um, and maybe seeing people develop and grow in spite of themselves? Oh, absolutely. Ab yeah, absolutely. I'm actually on my website, my testimonials page, I must update it, but I've got some great testimonials on there. Uh, I mean, one guy I remember saying, you know, I, I started this group with seven, we started this group with seven strangers, I now have, you know, seven of the closest friends I've ever had. Yeah. It was pretty filled up. <laughs> and it, it's little things like, you know, getting a photo of the new baby when the relationship was about to break down because of it. it it's, I suppose it's seeing people's self-esteem come back. Yeah. I think that sex addiction is, just because of the shame attached to it, it is one of the most degrading conditions there is. And it's not because of the sex, it's the dependency on it. And, Again, this is a bit of a myth that the, the shame isn't necessarily about visiting a sex worker, being with a prostitute. The shame is that I didn't go to my son's play because I'd rather do that. Because I wasn't with my wife when in hospital when her mum was dying. Yeah. Because I saw it as an opportunity to log on and watch porn. Mm. It's, it's the depth, it's their dependency that creates the shame. Yeah. And actually seeing them forgive themselves and grow is fantastic. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting, and I can only hope you'll give me a few minutes when your book is published in November. Yep, that would, that would be fantastic. I mean, I've also, uh, you know, which I'd love to have a link on the site to, I've developed, but it's not live yet, it's got to be live by the time the book comes out, so it's in the book, a, a free online resource. So there's, there's something called the Kickstart Recovery Programme, which is like a downloadable, completely free resource. It's not going to be the answer for everybody. If it's a severe case, it might just be a, an opportunity to learn more about addiction, do some of the, the assessment, understand a bit more about your triggers, and then hopefully go on and get some help or go to a 12 step. Um, but that's, that's going to be you know, completely free. For some people, it might be enough to get a grip. Because if you're early on enough in the process, the same with you know, alcohol, if you can recognise when it's becoming a problem, sometimes getting a grip is enough yeah. before it takes hold. So yeah, I'd love to have a link to that on the site. Patrick Khan said at a conference a couple of years ago, we've got a tsunami coming because of the internet. And I think he's absolutely right. And the links with porn addiction and erectile dysfunction as well are huge. You've been more than generous, Paula, with your time. You're very welcome. You've been listening to a podcast with Paula Hall. For more podcasts in the series, please visit www.noelbell.net forward slash podcasts.